and welcome to Dateline. I'm Jana Vent. Tonight, Indonesia takes the Howard government to task over cultural insensitivity. When you want to enter someone's uh, house, you cannot shout in front of it and then ask to enter the house. So that's what I thought, a kind of intercultural communications that we need to, to improve both sides. allegations of weapons trading that have never been investigated. If sections of the Australian government did assist in an illegal operation of the CIA and Israeli intelligence, it may have been morally questionable, but possibly not illegal. What would be illegal is that if that assistance was given for the personal profit of individuals or institutions of the Labor Party. It was a payment for the Labor Party. It was a contribution to the Labour Party, and then it gets dispersed. However, it's dispersed. The Iran-Contra hearings of a decade ago exposed one of the most sordid episodes in recent US history. It was a secret operation that saw arms swapped for hostages, the profits used to fuel a covert war, and almost brought down an American president. What has never been fully exposed is Australia's supporting role in that complex conspiracy. One of the key witnesses in the Iran-Contra hearings alleged that arms destined for Iran passed through Australia and millions of dollars were paid to help make that happen. These extraordinary allegations, first made on this program a decade ago, have never been investigated. Tonight, Mark Davis explores a chapter of Australian history that many seem keen to forget. ...of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters Inquiry into Electoral Funding and Disclosure. Today we'll be hearing from the AEC. A multi-party committee on electoral matters is meeting in Canberra. The Commission has already made it clear to the committee that it considers there are significant problems. With its general mission is to investigate issues of funding and disclosure to political parties. Uh, the allegations about Sources of funding is a sensitive issue for all parties, I mean, and a polite consensus usually rules meetings such as this. Clears up but one submission from a member of the public, a Queensland journalist, has forced a rather awkward issue onto the agenda. An allegation before the committee that donations were made improperly in 1985 in Western Australia. Uh, the allegations about... It's an issue involving substantial allegations of weapons trading and corruption in Australian politics which have never been investigated. An accusation which has been glaringly ignored for a decade. The water's far too muddy now. It's interesting to compare the American political and judicial response to the same allegations. Council, I respectfully and regretfully declined to answer the question based on my... The Iran-Contra hearings created a political storm and almost downed a president. The full story of how American intelligence agencies illegally traded weapons to Iran has never been completely told, but at least American politicians got halfway to the bottom of the barrel, and the public at least got to hear all sides of the issue freely aired in a public inquiry. One of the key witnesses in the Iran-Contra scandal was an Israeli intelligence officer imprisoned in America on arms dealing charges. Abandoned by Israel, he began to talk about the work he'd done for Israeli and American intelligence in trading weapons to Iran, and he was acquitted. Uh, who are the CIA-connected people? Uh, While awaiting various appearances before US Congress, Ari ben Manasha sought refuge in Australia, a place he'd visited many times during the gun-running operation to Iran. My name is Ari ben Manasha. On Dateline, ten years ago, he claimed that he had, with the authority of the Australian government, shipped weapons bound for Iran through Perth. Certain arms were shipped through Australia to Iran from the Israelis with the intervention of the Americans. When did this More disturbingly, he claimed it, that it payments had been made to sections of the Labor Party to facilitate the trade. 
Contributions, monies like that, always have <laughs> have a paper trail. Yes. Ari Ben Menashe's yeah, allegations were never investigated by no, police or security agencies. They were never put before a court, a commission, parliament, or parliamentary committee until has today. Been, uh, has been. But then again, it'd be a resources thing. It'd be more. I'd be more inclined to be thinking that we'd be looking at the present and the future rather than going too far into the past. Despite the low-key atmosphere, this committee enjoys rare powers to seek government records, to call witnesses under privilege, to confirm or discredit this accusation once and for all. Labor Party member Michael Danby is strongly against any discussion of the issue whatsoever. Why not? Put it, put it, put it to rest. Put it to rest. Why not? Why not because the, the committee has other priorities, because it's a 10-year-old allegation, and because it's based on um, uh, the, the, the claims of a person who uh, most people who seriously examine this don't feel has any credence. And payment to political parties... Marshall Wilson, a Queensland journalist, wrote the, the submission which requested that the committee investigate the claims. ...being convicted of the arms dealing... He had recently obtained Ben Menashe's immigration file, which revealed that the department was fully aware of Ben Menashe's claims and revealed the department's haste to get him out of the country. Ben Menashe was here on our shore applying for asylum. We had him in our hands. We could have gone and investigated every single allegation he was making, fully, fairly, frankly, it was never done. Why was it never done? Wilson saw the committee as the last chance under privilege to flush out the truth. We're more, we're more focused on domestic um, or put it this electoral way. matters put it this way. You domestic could ask, funding You could matters. ask within the Labor Party and uh, have those questions been asked. I mean, have you asked your Western Australian colleagues? Or? Well, all, all I know is, is that the senior people, when they see this, just laugh at it and regard it as a joke. asked for an interview by yourself and I'm doing good but you know what Ari Ben Menasha has to say involves allegations of the most extreme nature but oddly they have never been seriously addressed in Australia the story that uh, that you knew about an arms shipment from the US to Iran that was warehoused in Western Australia well look We've been tumbled. I'll come clean. Elvis gave us the money. Kim Beasley was Minister for Defence at the time of the alleged arms shipments through Perth 
and federally he was Labor's most prominent politician to hail from Western Australia. What really happened? Elvis rose from the grave and planted bucket loads of money on the desk of the Secretary of the Labor Party. We saw the federal Labor government in 1991 showed an equal lack of enthusiasm to give any credibility to the claim. <laughs> oh, they're, they're, they're come in the truth of Ari Ben Menashe's accusations has never been tested, but what this story unquestionably reveals is the abject failure of our security, political and judicial institutions, particularly those supposedly independent of government, to fulfil their investigatory obligations. <laughs> The background begins in 1979, when the Ayatollah Khomeini seized power in Iran and implemented the world's first modern Islamic theocracy, the precursor to Afghanistan's Taliban. America branded Iran the home of Islamic terrorism. Dozens of Americans had been kidnapped in Iran and by Iranian sympathizers in Lebanon. It was a slow torture for the American public. My name is Joan Walsh, W-A-L-S-H. What began as a secret weapons for hostage exchange burgeoned into a multi-billion dollar business for American and Israeli intelligence organizations with the knowledge of Reagan and Vice President Bush. We want the truth. When Iran went to war with Iraq, the potential profits the became irresistible. Fundamental right. Despite a congressional ban on weapons to Iran, American agencies saw an opportunity to raise black money to fund their favourite right-wing rebel group in Nicaragua, the Contras, which the American Congress had also banned them from assisting. Ayatollah Khomeini was the Bin Laden of his day, the sworn enemy of the great Satan America. The notion that Israeli and American intelligence agencies were selling him weapons was so bizarre that initially it beggared belief. A disbelief that allowed the operation to run for seven years before it was exposed. Originally, the plan to disguise the U.S. operation was a simple one. Sell massive amounts of weapons to ally Israel, who would then simply on-sell them secretly to the Iranians. A profitable plan for both nations that nearly came unstuck when the Russians shot down one of the Israeli cargo planes. The started <laughs> leaking out on the press about Israeli involvement in the Iran-Iraq war. So, third parties were necessary. We now know how Israel and America fed the bloody feud between Iran and Iraq. It is unquestionable that they used multiple third-party ports, many of them from distant locations such as South America, to disguise the trade. It is now alleged that another southern route was used as well. In Australia, and Perth in particular, the good times were rolling. The Hawke Labor government was in the middle of its record stint in power. The stock market was booming. Western Australian businessmen with intimate links to the Labor Party had come to national prominence. The expression Western Australian entrepreneurs was still a term used admiringly. It is alleged that at the time of the 1987 America's Cup in Perth, it wasn't just racing boats slipping into Western Australian harbours. Ari Ben Menasha maintains that he visited Australia frequently in the 1980s to oversee the occasional shipment but 87 was one of the biggest and final operations. 
Up to 10 front companies were used throughout the operation to ship thousands of tow missiles and other weapons through Western Australia. Ben Menasha believes that the operation had government or ministerial approval, but his direct dealings with Australian intelligence officers forms the cornerstone of his first-hand allegations, a claim that could be readily tested in any court or inquiry. Were, was any money or other favours given to Australian intelligence or customs uh, officials? Uh, to the bureaucratic level, no. No. Were they aware that uh, money was changing hands at the I wouldn't level? think so. I wouldn't think so. Possibly on the highest levels of the intelligence service, yes, but not, not on the bureaucratic customs of the, I wouldn't think so, no. So, uh, were but you... they were aware of the transactions. And what, 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 what the nature of those transactions was and what, what was well, being Well, they shipped. would be aware of what's coming in and going out. And where it was going and what it was for. And yeah, they'd just be aware of it so they wouldn't touch the cargo. The Australian government at the time denied that the weapons shipment had occurred. Given that an election campaign is underway, we stress that Kim Beasley denies any knowledge of such shipments and Ben Menasha specifically excludes him from any of his accusations regarding money. If sections of the Australian government did assist in an illegal operation of the CIA and Israeli intelligence, it may have been morally questionable given that tens of thousands of men, women and children were dying in one of the most brutal wars of modern times, but possibly not illegal. What would be illegal is that if that assistance was given for the personal profit of individuals or institutions of the Labour Party, as Ari ben Menasha maintains. So this money is going to what you say, the Labour Party and or Labour Party individuals? That's right. As cash payments? As, uh, yeah. Ben Menasha claims that as the operation wound up in 87, he was ordered by Tel Aviv to transfer six and a half million American dollars, more than eight and a half Australian, to Labour Party sources. The suggested vehicle was the John Curtin Australia. Foundation. Australia stands for and with the Empire. God only knows what John Curtin, a renowned socialist, would have thought of the Perth Foundation named in his honour. Liberty and freedom are in danger. Launched under the patronage of Premier Brian Burke and with the blessing of Prime Minister Bob Hawke, the billionaires of Perth clamoured on board as patrons of the John Curtin Foundation the new true believers. Allegations would later be made that the foundation was the key to doing business with the Labour government in Western Australia. Although no findings or allegations were made about the bulk of these patrons, the foundation was quietly dissolved in 1991 when it came under the intense scrutiny of the Royal Commission into Corruption in Western Australia. Certainly it surprised me and I think it surprised most Australians that anybody would even think that that was possible in our, our general policy. Yeah. I think it's quite naive about... Chairman of the um, committee, Liberal Party member Chris Pines. Um, do you want to comment on that? I have no way of knowing whether any of those allegations are true or not. I think it's up to the committee to determine that. With regard Western to Australian system. Democrat Andrew Murray believes that the committee should at least sure, make further inquiries. We well, put a smear across the Labor Party. In Michael Danby presents yeah, one of the U.S. Congress reports which criticise Ben Menasha, the the but the findings here, of that report you know, were in themselves uh, widely criticised. He also asserts that Ben Menasha is in effect a fraud that he was never an Israeli intelligence agent. Mr Ben, ben Menashe's um, submi own submission to the committee showed that he was um, uh, a translator for the 
Israeli army. So on the central question of whether Ari ben Menashe is who he says he is, Michael Dandy offers rather ironic evidence. Yeah, but this is, this is a Defence Force reference. What are they? The papers he is referring to were the key to proving Ben Menashe's bona fides. Well, they're probably not, but why would they he send discovered by Newsweek journalist Bob Parry. Been, I'd heard his name connected with a number of the uh, Iran-Contra developments as, as, a, as, a, as some kind of spooky Israeli operative who sort of showed up in a number of cases. But I never could find him. Uh, and then I, was, I got a call from someone who said, well, if you're looking for him, he's, he's in federal prison now up in New York. Bob Parry was one of the first journalists to break the Iran-Contra story and the first to provide objective analysis of Ben Menashe's identity. Uh, to that point, Israel had been saying that Ben Menashe was a fraud, that they didn't know who he was. He was just sort of making all this all, making these stories up. And they told the U.S. government that in connection with the prosecution. Uh, it was Bob Parry who discovered the references that Danby is referring to. There were three, uh, I received three letters of reference uh, signed by um, Israeli military officers. Um, the, uh, and they basically discussed his important role in various uh, activities of, uh, of military intelligence. The references were genuine and proved that he worked for military intelligence. The particulars of his intelligence assignments are not described, but there is absolutely no reference or implication that he was a translator. They refer to him holding key positions responsible for a variety of complex and sensitive assignments which demanded exceptional analytical and executive capabilities and another that he was in charge of a task which demanded considerable analytical and executive skills. The, the Israelis clearly were trying to uh, contain the information that Ben Menashe was giving out, all of which needed to be checked, but in terms of him being who he said he was, uh, we, I concluded that he was telling the truth. All right, would you state your name? My name is Ari Ben Menashe. And you are a citizen of what country? Israel. Where are you living now? In Australia. You understand, Mr. Ben Menashe, that this is pursuant to an informal inquiry uh, by some members of Congress to determine uh, whether or not a congressional... While Australia was pretending that he didn't exist, other institutions accepted his experience and background and then tested his evidence. He was twice summoned to American congressional hearings as well as called as a witness to the Defence Committee of British Parliament. He was one of the key witnesses in exposing Robert Maxwell's links to Israeli intelligence, revealing Maxwell's involvement in weapons dealing and dubious money movements for Israel. relationship between the Israeli intelligence service and Robert Maxwell and in particular Mr Nicholas Davies, the news editor. One of those implicated in the accusations was one of Maxwell's editors, Nick Davies, who Menasha directly implicated in arms deals. Davies' legal case against Ben Menasha was dropped and he was sacked by his newspaper when it was revealed that Menasha's claims were correct. Equipment, military... Whatever else may be said about Ari Ben Menasha, Few would now doubt that he did work for Israeli intelligence and that he was extensively involved in the shipment of weapons to Iran. And it's also known that he frequented Australia during this period in the 1980s. So it was time to make some payments. But when he was in Australia in 1991 to early 92, no federal agency investigated his claims. More details were published in his book, Prophets of War, in 1992. Only a few paragraphs dealt with his time in Australia, but they are extraordinarily frank paragraphs. He writes of how the payment was made through a US front company controlled by Richard Babian. So Richard Babian was responsible for the, the, the negotiations and, yeah, the, and, and, right. and the money. 
Richard Babian worked for the Shah's secret police before the Iranian Revolution and had extensive connections in both Iran and America. We actually were in school, in the same American school in Tehran together. And uh, later on, when the revolution came by, he left Iran and he went to the States and he was working for the U.S. government. In what, in what capacity? What, what arm of the U.S. government? Uh, CIA. He was CIA operative. Yeah. And he was in Australia. Although the paragraphs in his book were brief, they were certainly not coy or vague. The following account has never been challenged legally or publicly denied. He claims that Babian was in contact with Yossi Goldberg, a prominent Perth businessman, close associate of and major donor to Premier Brian Burke. The book claims that through Goldberg, the cheque passed to Alan Bond as patron of the John Curtin Foundation and was then passed through companies associated with Robert Maxwell, which disguised and dispersed the funds. Ben Menasha believes that part of the money was directed to the John Curtin Foundation with or without the knowledge of the patrons and the remainder dispersed to other party sources and individuals. Neither Yossi Goldberg nor Alan Bond chose to make any comment to this program but there is no implication that either of them personally received any money nor that they would have been aware of the source of those funds or their ultimate destination. So as far as you're aware, the, 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 the principal payment is made as a, a, a lump sum payment? Yeah. And then it's dispersed? Yeah. To whom? Or to what bodies? Again, it was a payment for the Labour Party. It was a contribution to the Labour Party. And then it gets dispersed. However, it's dispersed. So... There wouldn't be a, uh, a single uh, $6 million deposit? In no, I don't believe that for a minute. So broken up, in, 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 in what way? Just explain to me how would this be broken up? I mean, is this cash? <laughs> Generally is this... speaking, these payments would always be broken up in pieces and different pieces uh, coming from different places. That's why businessmen were used. When he first made these claims, they could have been easily verified or dismissed by any competent investigator. Shipping records, banking records, names, dates, places, all could have been scrutinised if there was the will, which it appears there wasn't. Nothing but a stony silence. It has been claimed that Ben Menasha's account was too vague for any investigation to be launched. It is an accusation that amuses him. He did provide complete details to at least one Australian authority, and the supporting evidence is not with him. Today, it's sitting in a filing cabinet in Australia. Now it's up to the Australians to decide what they want to do with it. In the months before he was thrown out of the country, he came to the attention of the Royal Commission into Corruption in Western Australia, the WA Inc. Inquiry. No reference to Ben Menasha appears in the public reports, but it would now seem that his story didn't seem so implausible to them. So you weren't holding back. I mean, this is very important. You, you spoke with Royal Commission investigators. You weren't holding back on the information that you had? No. It was clear and unambiguous? In my opinion, it was clear and unambiguous. And it was supported by documentary evidence? Some of it was, yes. And they would retain that document, still retain that documentary evidence, presumably? I don't know what they do with their evidence. It would seem that the Western Australian authorities aren't too sure what they did with the evidence either. Western Australian Director of Public Prosecutions, Robert Cock. Um, have you seen the record? I mean, what records do you... All have? I've seen is a short note confirming that, that the allegations that were made publicly by Mr. Ben, Arsh, Mr. ben Menasha are also made to the Royal Commissioners. Six weeks ago, at the urging of Andrew Murray, the Electoral Matters Committee Chairman 
confidentially wrote to the West Australian Director of Public Prosecutions. The DPP is the custodian of the Royal Commission records and his advice was sought on whether the records contained any information that would be relevant to their inquiry. Six weeks later, there has been no reply, and more disturbingly, the records have not been found. No, I understand that, but, but you have been requested by a parliamentary yes. committee, and you have not been able to ascertain whether the records exist. You've found two pages or whatever. I've found some material, yes. And is that appropriate? Is that an appropriate response? Well, I haven't concluded my response to the parliamentary committee yet, so it's perhaps premature to express an opinion. How substantial was the information that you gave to the investigators? Was it an oral account? Or, I mean, how, how detailed? Of course it was an oral account, yeah. but there were documents that, that were given to them. Have those documents seen the light of day before? Have they been released in any way? No. Have you released them? No. A senior source within the DPP's office maintains that the records concerning Ari ben Menasha and all related material are missing. It's an assertion that Robert Koch denies, but he agrees that they haven't been found, nor has any record of their whereabouts been found. The Parliamentary Committee is requesting something of you which is beyond uh, what was published uh, yes. ten years ago. They have information that these files contain matters that were never publicly revealed. So as a DPP, as a prosecutor, isn't it well within your ambit to, to make best effort to get those files and to consider whether there's anything worth uh, investigating? I think my role is certainly to ensure that if there's evidence of a criminal offence that would be appropriately prosecuted in the present environment, that is, it's not too stale and the evidence is still useful, then I'd prosecute it. But nothing's come to my attention to suggest that anything of that nature exists or, or should be examined. But you haven't seen the files? That's right. Marshall Wilson provides evidence of how detailed the WA Inc. investigation was. Two years ago, he recorded an interview with one of the Royal Commission investigators, which has never been broadcast or published. The investigator's identity and position has been confirmed. Sorry, the cheque was drawn on the Channel Islands account mm -hmm. and it was at a local bank in which a lot of the Royal Commission players were, were, were playing. If, if I recall, we had a photocopy of the cheque mm -hmm. with the date, the amount, everything. Gee. That's never been made public, obviously. I don't believe so. Right. Apart from what Ben Menasha has claimed, there has never been any public understanding that such extraordinary material was gathered. Senior sources within the Royal Commission confirm that a major investigation was underway when it was cancelled, not concluded, just cancelled. I should say that I'm not in any way suggesting files are missing, I'm simply saying I haven't sought to access them other than in a peremptory way. And when I did that, I only found, found a couple of papers. The pages that Robert Koch has found confirm one useful fact, that the investigators had been in communication with Richard Babian. The man Ben Menasha maintains was used to pass the funds. Richard Babian has had a chequered career over the past decade, and he left America suddenly three years ago during a State Department investigation. Currently, he is somewhere in Europe, and I called him from Paris to request a meeting. Hello. Yes, it's uh, Richard Babillon there, please. Speaking, yes. Sir, my name's uh, Mark Davis. I'm a uh, journalist from Australia. I'm Babillon in, uh, declines Paris, any meetings or discussions. Uh, he I'm believes I'm that the time for that has now passed. I hope you understand. I, I'm trying to put a certain section of my life behind me, and I paid my dues, and... Uh, I understand, you know, sir. Enough is enough, and, uh, and uh, there was a time when certain people in Australia could have looked at these things. I guess they weren't interested at that time. I, I don't see why anything at this time was so many... In the brief things. notes discovered by the DPP is a reference relating to Babian, that he was prepared to testify and provide full documentation if an inquiry proceeded. Uh, 
very sad that, uh, that when, when the time was right, nothing was done. And, uh, and I think, again, if anything comes out, it will be, uh, make some noise and it will be blown away. As a matter of fact, my memory is fading. All right, Okay, bye. All right, thank you. On the available evidence, it's difficult to see why such an investigation could have been cancelled. Two sources confirm that commissioners regarded the Ben Menasha matters as beyond the territory and scope of a Western Australian inquiry. That is, it led to national issues. And it would seem that those issues were of an explosive nature. Ben Menasha claims that the complete information that he was giving to investigators put the payments into a broader context that there was a long history of payments by Israeli and American intelligence agencies to a source within the Labor Party. So if you put this into context, you won't, it won't look so, you know, people say, where did this money come from? Why did it come? And I said, you know, what people don't realize, there was a flow of money outside money over the years to the Labour Party from various sources. <coughs> um, when you say various sources, various foreign sources. Foreign though. sources, that's right. And but uh, the, or the origins of this flow of money, the origins, I'm not saying directly from the uh, various uh, the U.S. or the Israeli governments, and the origins could be traced to the U.S. or is Israeli governments, but they would go through business people that are connected and so on. The, so foreign... the context of this accusation concerns a particular individual who Ben Menasha names, rather than the Labour Party in general. He claims that this was the broader issue that he was providing information about to the Western Australian investigators. Connected with intelligence agencies that would contribute to the... The WA Inc. investigator recorded here indicates this was one of the areas being investigated when the inquiry was ended. That it was a little too sensitive given the circumstances of what the overall picture was with Ben Manash. Yes, yes. Further sections of this tape indicate an individual and can't be played. Is there anybody who has the capacity to remove files from this office without your authority? Legally, legal no, no that, would be, that would be a criminal offence to remove files without my authority. Whether it's a Premier's Department or... Absolutely right. Uh, ...an Australian Intelligence uh, Agency? That's correct. ...would not be able to remove files? That's correct. Files. It's yet to be established whether the records still exist and if they do, whether the Western Australian DPP is prepared to give any indication of what they may contain to the Parliamentary Committee or other federal authority. But before Ari Ben Menasha left the country in 1992, he gave some details to one other individual. John Howard, then leader of the opposition, had at least three extensive meetings with Ben Menasha. I said that I was sufficiently interested and impressed with what he had to say to go on listening. Oh, why don't you ask him? I will ask him. But Please I'll, do. Well, he'll give his version. I'm interested in, 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 no, no, in yours. Uh, no, uh, I'm sure he'll give the right version. <laughs> so, the only thing I'll say is, please ask him about the matter. John Howard declined to be interviewed for this program or provide any written response to questions regarding his discussions with Ari Ben Menasha and his reasons for never at least airing the matter under parliamentary privilege. Okay, I'm going to say thank you very much. Can I ask a question about Ari uh, Ben Menasha? We met him on several occasions. Did you find his claims uh, credible? A spokesman for the Prime Minister later advised that Mr Howard had met with Ari Ben Menasha, that he found Ben Menasha's allegations interesting, but to the best of his recollection, he did not receive enough material to raise the issue in Parliament.
It's unclear whether John Howard received the same information that WA Inc. investigators received. If he did, his ability to respond now would be compromised by his ten years of silence. John Howard has never discredited Ari ben Manasha. The role of, uh, yeah, he was pretty much aware of it. Yeah. He was already aware of it? Yeah, well... Uh, the political advantage to Howard would have been obvious, but perhaps the consequences of raising this issue were too great. It could have exposed intelligence operations of two allies, friends and allies needed by a future Prime Minister. At the time Mr Howard was talking with Ben Menasha, Ben Menasha was providing critical testimony against both the director of the CIA and the then serving president, George Bush. To make matters worse, Margaret Thatcher's son had recently been accused of involvement in the arms business and Ben Menasha had had dealings with him as well. Perhaps overall the costs were too great. Perhaps they still are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you know, the AEC values our relationship. The Electoral Matters Committee has been dissolved pending the results of the election. We look forward, shares those we look forward to the next Parliament and, uh, and the conclusion of this inquiry. And with that, I close the uh, meeting. Thank you. It's yet to be seen who the next Parliament will appoint as members and what their agendas will be. Mark Davis with that report. And that is our program for tonight and for this season. Our thanks to you for supporting us throughout the year and for all your contributions to our website, guest book. Much appreciated. And in case you're wondering, Dateline will be back in mid-January and we look forward to your company then. Good night. <laughs>